Catherine Rudloff has built her career in Republican politics, working for Rudy Giuliani and Brevard County Congressman Bill Posey. She's now the executive director of Business Voice Pack, a political action committee that represents the interests of Brevard's business community. Welcome to I Am Brevard, I'm Isadora Rangel. Rudloff hasn't shied away from criticizing her own party in the past. In our interview this week, we took a hard look at the upcoming elections for governor, U.S. Senate, and Brevard's hottest elections. Catherine, thank you for being on the show again. Absolutely, thank you for having me. So um, you were here before the primaries in August, mm -hmm. and it was com a completely different landscape. Totally. We had no idea that, that Andrew Gillum was going to win the primary, although we knew DeSantis was surging, but mm -hmm. we didn't know he was going to win by almost 20, 20 points. points. So um, in light of all of that, the first question I want to ask you is, um, can we still trust polls? Because a lot of the questions I'm going to be asking are around the polls that we have seen in the gubernatorial race. Sure. So the, the methodology of polling has certainly been called into question in recent election cycles. Um, as I'm sure most viewers will know, you know, with just fewer people having landlines and how they do that. But polling companies are advancing their techniques. So um, a lot of times in some of the polls I've seen this year, they have a th certain threshold that they want to make sure are cell phones that they are doing. And then you're actually seeing some that in addition to having um, dialed for their surveys, that they are switching to some online methodologies. And then you're being able to see results that take in a little bit of both. Um, because at the end of the day, I think it's always important to remember that polling is done as a tool. It is just one tool that a, that a campaign uses. We like to entertain them and, and you know, oodle over them, but campaigns use them just to measure, like how are their messages resonating? And sometimes the only numbers that get released or when newspapers do it are those approval or disapproval, but what they really are intended for is some of the deeper questions that get asked of people is do you agree with this or disagree with that? And it's just a tool that helps change the tactics for campaigns. So I think we can still trust them. And obviously 2016, <coughs> Trump surprised the country. Yeah. No one have, um, there were, there were a few. There were a few. There were a few. But I remember looking at you know Hillary Clinton had an eighty percent chance of winning according mm -hmm. to the New York Times, according to I think uh, is it five thirty eight, yep, all those 538. websites. But um, so let's look at uh, one of the latest polls in the gubernatorial race. It mm -hmm. shows a virtual tie with Andrew Gillum leading by just one point and a mm -hmm. margin of error of three and a half points. Mm -hmm. It seems like the the same thing is happening in the U.S. Senate race between Rick Scott and Bill yep. Nelson. In your opinion, what is going to carry the winner across the finish line here? Well, the same thing that brought Andrew Gillum across the finish line on the primary day. It is all about when you peak and peaking at the right time. Um, so again, if we look at polling as a way to track communication methodology and what their strategies are, um, we're almost at the point now where those tools are, are done for the campaign and they are executing their get out the vote plan. So by now they know what messages that they want to speak to which voters. Um, we're all seeing the TV commercials, the radio ads, online ads, your mailboxes will be getting full and they're hoping to communicate the right messages to the right voters um, to peak. The one uh, quantifiable difference that, that all candidates try to strive in that momentum change sometimes happens on the ground and sometimes because those larger media communications plans were put in place weeks ago um, it's really paying attention to when we start to see rallies when you start to see debates who can have a momentum changing um, shift happen and will they peak at the right time but in Florida when you're practically a 50-50 state with one-third undecided yeah. NPA in the middle um, it's gonna come down to the wire no matter how no matter what each campaign does um, we really won't know. Um, I don't see this being a landslide in either direction. And, and, and Gillum, obviously, we talked about how he surprised everyone, but it seems to me that for him to win, he needs to turn out that minority vote, the black vote, which carried him in the primary, right? Um, can he win if those people don't show up? I mean, what do you see happening? Well, I mean, I never say never, in any, but he certainly, that is that is a core constituency that absolutely must turn out and one of the concerns that they have in any election um, is that you get people fired up and rallied too early and then they don't show up on election day and I would argue that this year um, you know having the Supreme Court yeah. issues at the top of the ticket which I know you want to talk about both sides are very motivated right now to turn out so we already saw elevated turnout significant number increase in, in voters that actually turned out to the polls in the primary I expect for a midterm election in the state of Florida 
we're going to see ex higher than normal turnout for a midterm election. And it brought up the, the Kavanaugh confirmation, mm -hmm. and I think the storyline so far has been that this is going to help turn out Republican voters because they're so mad by how the Democrats behaved mm -hmm. during the hearings. Um, what is your take on that? Do you see that actually happening? We've seen the polls at least reflect. Some oh, they of have. That. Yeah, no, the, the presidential approval rating and then just the overall generic ballot has shifted a little bit into re Republicans' favor. Um, I like to joke that it's Newton's third law and it applies to physics and politics equally the same. Every action has what the equal and you know opposite reaction. So when we saw the the left get fired up and and kind of seize on the accusations and 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 maybe that they had a chance to stop that confirmation, well then that just caused the counter reaction you know on the Republican side. So. Um, one of the interesting turn of events is actually that here in Florida now, our Supreme Court just ruled that the next governor will get to fill three open vacancies on the state Supreme Court. Uh, governor Scott was rather hoping that he would have the opportunity to appoint three judges before leaving office, and that was just decided yesterday. So for all the excitement that we saw at the national level over those um, over that lifetime appointment, I think that you are going to start to hear um, both Republican and Democratic, particularly the gubernatorial candidates, talking about the state Supreme Court and who is going to have the opportunity to fill um, those three seats um, here in Florida. Is it an issue that, that conservatives <coughs> care more than liberals in general? Or? Um, I feel, it, it would be my opinion, that um, conservatives absolutely are much more um, judicial minded. I feel like when you hear a Republican candidate say we have to prevent activist judges, that is like a trigger for just conservatives who they're one thing. And when we saw it in 2016, there were there were plenty of Republicans who were very open that they were voting for Trump but holding their nose because they wanted to make sure that a Republican president got to appoint um, the next Supreme Court justice. So it, it absolutely does. But when you see the reaction that we had under the Brett Kavanaugh, you know, um, the left is certainly fired up about that as well this year. So. And what do you think? Um, you think that the Democrats made any mistakes in how they handled the, the Kavanaugh oh, yeah. issue that it in turn created this backlash? Yeah. What are some of the things that you saw that were some of those missteps? Um, well, there's, you know, I mean, you have to take everything at face value. You know, did uh, Senator Feinstein really not leak it? Yeah. Did she have it and say, I'm holding on to it, you know, out of respect for private? Well, then who leaked it? If only you and her lawyer yeah. in your office had it, well then who leaked it to the press and did go for it because um, the way that it came about so late, you know, I think really hurt them. If it had come out earlier, if they had something and had come out, um, then perhaps it wouldn't have felt like such a, a last minute attempt um, to do it. That was probably um, their big, but the whole thing was a mistake. I personally um, despise judicial hearings and the circus that it has become. Um, I think that is not at all what our founders intended for it to be. I hate to see them be so politicized and I think both sides really were an embarrassment and the whole process um, I really couldn't watch. I mean it's just it's an embarrassment and the to concern, see how they handle it. The concern to me is that it sets a precedent <clears throat> for oh. other confirmation hearings which we will have. They're just getting worse and worse and worse. It feels like every time we have an opening on the Supreme Court it is going to become more and more of a circus. Um, and that it will be truly impossible to find um, a consensus type candidate where both sides could say this is this is a qualified you know judicial representative so. yeah and it's, this is a sign of but I was watching a, a documentary about RBG mm -hmm. uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and it was showing her confirmation hearing in which a Republican senator says, you know, I'm against everything you've done, but I'm still voting to confirm, confirm you. you. And that was 26 years yeah. ago, I want to say. And it was just like, wow, this is something unheard yeah. of in it, today's it's, politics. It's, it is a sign that it is, I cannot win at all unless I make you look terrible. You know, that there is there's this no idea where we can have an agreement, where we can disagree on policy points but still come out on something that is the same. It has to be total and 100 percent opposition. You know, there is no room for compromise, no room for acknowledging the other side brings up valid points or even that one resume is as equally qualified as another resume. It is, um, it is a sad state in Washington. And where do you think that started? People look at 2016, but it, mm -hmm. I think it started a, a long time before you had people like Sarah Palin uh, mm -hmm. come into prominence. You had the Clinton issues and where did it start? It wasn't just something that sort of 
kind of happened slowly? I think it, it has crept in slowly. I think how we communicate as a country um, and how our representatives communicate with individuals has changed because it's no longer relational. Everything is soundbite. Everything is short snippet, you know, from how they communicate on campaigns to how everything is projected in the media. Um, I also, I was in D.C. in 2006, and I saw moderates get completely pushed out from the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. So it was happening from within as much as it was from the external forces kind of pushing on representatives. But whatever caused it, there are too few people willing to buck the trend right now. And as a Republican, how do you see your party's chances of retaining the House of Representatives this year? Because the Democrats have to win 23 seats to flip the House. The Senate is they have a chance, but it's a long shot a chance harder. because of it's a different map, map mm. this year for them. But do you see Republicans retaining in the, the House? Florida House in the in the U.S. House. in the U.S. Yeah. House? Um, the same, House the, same could, <laughs> the same could be true for both because for a while yeah. the Democrats were trying to say they had a chance at the Florida Senate as well and that they're going after. But um, it, that, you know, I mean, because of midterm history, and I'm sure people hear this all the time, traditionally in the first midterm election for a new president, they do lose seats. Their party loses seats. And we see that the American people like to have that check of a different party controlling the House. I do think that the momentum nationwide is certainly with the Democrats there, but um, you cannot overestimate the influence of uh, gerrymandering in districts drawn because the map is just so small where there are truly competitive seats. So um, you've, you've kind of got to clear the deck you know, and win them all. There's not a lot of room for error. Um, to do so, but we'll see. I mean, I'm, I'm, I watch every day to see which race is, is taken off and, and who's not, and um, we, I truly don't think we will know until Election Day. It's just a very divided divided electorate right now. And we and the, and the U.S. Senate, the Democrats are, are defending seats in very red states. Very red states. Uh, Missouri, West Virginia, and others. Seems like it's going to be very hard for Democrats to retain, but they, they seem to think that they have a chance. They, they do. I mean, every you, you have to be optimistic until the end, no matter what yeah. side of the aisle. You know, you can't. Or you have out, to say you are. You have to least. say you are. You know, you have to project that optimism to encourage people to come with you. But the the having a intense Supreme Court battle like that happen in I mean, it was really unprecedented. Normally, Congress on both sides takes a break in August. Yeah. Every August, not just in campaign years, but every August they take a break. But it was announced at the beginning of the year McConnell was going to keep them there. They knew that this confirmation hearing was going to be coming out and they wanted their members taking those hard votes right before the midterm election so um, we'll see how the voters respond and one of those battleground um, Senate seats is the one where Bill Nelson yeah, right is running here. against yep. Rick Scott uh, Rick Scott um, in the previous polls was ahead mm -hmm. Bill Nelson started to spend more money and now I think they're in what you would describe a virtual tie, tie. Yep. Um, but that's interesting Bill Nelson starts to spend money because he was basically not spending any He's money spending early anything, on yeah. and I think people have shifted to a mentality where money doesn't really matter that much in politics anymore but it seems that this proves that the more you spend the better your numbers are well it's not so much the more you spend the better your numbers are but voters don't pay attention you and I pay attention and probably True. anybody watching this video yeah. pays attention <laughs> and, and, and cares about politics but the vast majority of Americans do not and so it takes resources to get in their face whether you're reaching them online, on TV, or whatever, but it takes significant resources. And all those grassroots folks, they, they cost money. There's not a lot of people who volunteer to do that kind of yeah. stuff anymore. You know, everybody's getting resources somewhere. So you have to spend money in order to reach voters. Um, and it was interesting, I pulled up the numbers, but so far outside money, outside groups, so not the candidates' campaigns, but outside groups have spent $42 million in the U.S. Senate race here in Florida. And Nelson has gotten the majority of that. About $25 million has um, been spent to support Nelson and about $17 million to support wow. Scott or oppose Nelson. Um, and then Scott just gave himself another um, hefty chunk you know, to help get him through. His cash on hand was dwindling, so he just wrote another check to his campaign. It just takes it takes resources. And Florida has how many media markets? You know this. Ten, ten media ten, markets. Yeah. Um, it is an expensive state to run statewide in. Um, and when we see, when we talked about this before, a county commission race, 
that's going to cost probably $150,000 by the time it's done, maybe pushing $200,000 for a Brevard County Commission race. Well, multiply that by our 67 counties, you can see how the millions of dollars add up very quickly. And I assume you're talking about District 2 District on the 2. County Commission. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to ask you about that. Uh, we have Republican Brian Lober running against a Democrat, mm -hmm. Victoria Michener. Uh, she's African-American and a veteran. He, he is a lawyer who was formerly uh, registered as an independent. He has put in a lot of his own money into this campaign, money. but I'm starting to hear that she is getting actually support from from groups. Um, your group is one of them. My Business group has Voice. endorsed her. Yeah, uh, but there's also some cash coming in. I mean, what mm -hmm. is ha why are people rallying behind? a Democrat in a county like Brevard, in, in a district that leans Republican? Well, I think there's two reasons. One, that that was a very ugly primary, and I think Brian didn't do himself any favors by running such a nasty primary campaign. So that, that just turns a lot of people off. You know, negative campaigning has its consequences, and you have to do what you have to do to get elected, and, and that's a choice every candidate has to make, but then waking up in living with that you know the day after when you have to try to you know switch to a general and bring people together that can be difficult so I think he did splinter um, maybe his Republican base a little bit so there are some more Republicans and, and folks that were a little bit turned off by his tactics um, that are willing to get behind Victoria I also think Democrats have an opportunity in Central County it is um, <clears throat> entirely open seats we have House District 51, an open seat. We have School Board, open seat. Port Commission, open seat. County Commission, open seat. And now we even have the U.S. Senate, or not the U.S. Senate, I'm sorry, but the Florida Senate, after Senator Huckel passed away, that's now technically an open seat. So they have five open seat races, all in that kind of central and north county area. And the Democrats have been working all year, you know, in their GOTV and their um, efforts there. And I think that there is a momentum shift um, uh, and certainly behind Victoria, she's probably one of their more outstanding candidates that they were able to recruit. Um, and so people are willing to get behind her and say, of all the years and of all the races, there's an opportunity because there's going to be so much GOTV and communication efforts put into making sure that the, the Democratic base and talking to independents is really elevated in that central part of the county. And I mean, I mean uh, Rob Landers, our producer, he lives in Rockledge, and he said that Democrats have knocked on his door at least twice. You hear about Super Sunday, which is when they canvass mm -hmm. a specific area for a specific candidate, I believe. I mean, is this something new in Brevard? I mean, I haven't lived here that long, but this is, is not a county where you think Democratic Party. You think no, it's, it's not. So I, I joke, you know, like following elections for the last couple of cycles, um, in 2016, I was so frustrated because they had not updated the local DEC like website <laughs> for information or calendars or you know what was going on um, since the 2014 election. So wow. like the, like they were just of of not a lot of use to me as somebody who's trying to pay attention and monitor and communicate with both sides of the aisle um, on behalf of, of Business Voice. Um, and so to see the organization that they've put in place this time, our county has definitely not seen this kind of two-party activism in quite a while. So the new leadership in the Democratic Party, that's Stacey Patel and mm -hmm. her husband Sanjay Patel, who's running against the longtime Congressman Bill Posey, mm -hmm. whom you worked oh, you for. Work for. Yeah. Uh, people are saying this is the first time that Posey, <coughs> who is in a heavily Republican district, has a quote-unquote real opponent. Sanjay has raised more money than anyone expected. Is that true? Is this the first? Is this the real challenge to Bill Posey? I don't think anybody expects Sanjay to win, but they expect him to make Posey work to keep work a little bit seat. harder. Um, I would definitely say yes. I mean, it's the first candidate that's that's challenged Bill. That's running a campaign, you know, the entire you know, let's call it four month stretch of the summer. Um, he certainly had candidates before um, in the general election. Gabe Rothblatt, you know, he he spoke out a little bit, but he really wasn't in the congressman's face on a regular basis. And Bill has had primary challengers, most notably his first two elections, where he had to spend a good bit of the, the early part of the summer kind of fending off strong primary candidates. But Sanjay definitely, he's running, he's running to win, whether or not the, the cards are there just with the numbers and the breakdown of the particular district. But he's forcing Congressman Posey to work a lot harder than what he's had to work um, certainly in years past. Does he have a path to victory? I, I don't remember the numbers, but I think 
there's more than a 10 percent voter registration yeah. difference in that. I mean, that I don't think Bill's lost with less than 60 percent wow. of the vote. You know, and he's somebody that when you look at their overall career, started off as, you know, his daughter's softball coach, moved on to, you know, city council in Rockledge, then the House, then the Florida Senate there. He has relationships with a lot of people throughout the community um, and as wonderful of a job as Sanjay and Stacy are doing in organizing Democrats this year. Um, you can't kind of erase 30 years of personal relationship overnight and really the X factor is Indian River County um, and that's the biggest um, challenge that Sanjay faces. He could perform quite well in Brevard. Who knows what we might see in terms of turnout in Brevard but Indian River is a, if you think Brevard is Republican, Indian River is even more Republican yeah. <clears throat> and Indian River is an even harder community to get to know because a lot of those voters are seasonal. They're not there. You've either gotten to know them over the last 20 years or you're not necessarily going to see them and meet them this summer because they don't come back down until you know, October, November, um, but they sure do get their mail ballots and they'll vote. Very interesting. And uh, let's move on to Palm Bay. You have Randy Fine, our state representative mm -hmm. from Melbourne Beach, who is uh, probably one of the most controversial politicians in Brevard County. Um, he has um, some, a lot of Republicans disagree with his style of politics. Mm -hmm. um, he's known for going after local officials and uh, trying to meddle in county commission issues. You know, he has a Democrat running against him, Phil Moore, who happens to have almost 30 traffic tickets or citations mm -hmm. and issues in that, that arena. Have Democrats lost an opportunity to regain, to take a seat that is only, I think Republicans have only like a 2% register, voter registration advantage yeah. in? Absolutely. Well, the, the <clears throat> the easiest time to beat someone is before they get elected. And then the easiest time to beat somebody after that is in their first yeah. re-election. And Randy certainly gave Democrats a lot of gifts this year with some negative headlines and, and lots of reasons for many Republicans to not be thrilled with his um, demeanor, if not his actual performance. Um, but unfortunately, uh, Phil Moore has not been able to raise the resources because he has a bit of a flawed record that, that Randy's able to certainly capitalize and, and pounce on out there. Um, and then Phil's not been willing to really go after Randy. So, you know, to win an election like that, you really have to be willing to show voters that um, I'm going to talk about, you know, why you really shouldn't vote for him. Um, and that's hard because everyone wouldn't, you know, oh, that negative campaigning, it's a fine line. Um, but going out and touting about your record um, isn't going to be quite enough to overcome the resources that Randy has. I mean, I think Randy has, you know, at least over $100,000 in his direct campaign account, um, let alone what he has a pack on the side. And, you know, Mr. Moore has raised, you know, just a couple thousand dollars. So um, if you're going to overcome that kind of spending resources, you really would have had to be more effective um, in, in communicating with voters, you know, why they should vote no, because they're going to hear a lot from Randy. They're going to get mail that he's already on TV, he's doing Facebook ads of why they should vote for him. Um, and unfortunately, Phil just doesn't have enough to be able to overcome that. But again, that's the closest district, and if the turnout is there, um, uh, you know, a couple thousand votes is all it takes. You know, has Randy Fine offended 2,000 Republicans um, who will either not vote for him or would go so far as to vote for a Democrat? Um, because you do see that a lot. When somebody's an unpalatable candidate, people just skip and say, oh, I'm just not going to vote in that race. So, And it seems like Democrats are relying on Gillum <coughs> turning out voters who normally that is the hope. don't vote. I mean, do you see that happening? I am not familiar with their grassroots and on the ground efforts, but I, I love seeing races get more competitive in Brevard. I think that when you have competitive elections and you can have serious debates between serious candidates, that that is a great thing. But I've been really disappointed that the Democrats um, they view campaign financing as a secondary effort, and you can recruit the the best candidates in the world, but if they don't have the resources to talk to voters. Um, then really you're, you're not going to be able to win an election, you know, and, and it's, it is a chicken and an egg. Folks don't like saying that, that money um, drives politics, but it's not that money drives politics, it's that it's very expensive to communicate and to get the attention of modern voters. Um, you have to be able to m communicate in an effective manner, and it does take resources, and unfortunately they are relying very heavily on GOTV, and I think that will get them a few points. And I think GOTV being? <clears throat> get out the vote. Get out that the vote. efforts to, you know, the, the door knocking, the sign waving, the, you know, events and the Super Sundays to try to motivate people in person, but those still, um, they've done a great job. I mean, Democrats have really done an outstanding job. They'll get a few points 
from that. But when you talk about having to move the needle farther and take votes away from somebody, that takes multiple touches um, in campaign communication. So we'll see. I mean, of all the races that there is a chance, we have that South County House District, and then like I said, we have that kind of Central County where there's a significant amount of GOTV effort happening on the ha behalf and of the plus Democrats. Money, apparently. <clears throat> and, and if some money comes Victoria's way, you could see that that needle start to move. And I want to talk about the uh, two school board uh, races. One mm -hmm. of them you mentioned in District Two. The other one is District is District Five, which mm -hmm. covers Palm Bay, West Melbourne. And uh, those are two very competitive <clears throat> races. And I'm not surprised, but have turned into very partisan races. <clears throat> although these are. Uh, technically nonpartisan, nonpartisan races, yeah. but you see the Democrats pushing their candidates in municipal and other nonpartisan races like yeah. this. Uh, is that normal for these uh, school board races to no, become so No, normally partisan? school boards aren't aren't that partisan. And in addition, because the the Democrats locally have have been engaging more um, in communicating with voters, I think that's one reason. But honestly, the gun issue I think is is the biggest issue because of what happened in Parkland, because of where the debate and all eyes are on the school board. Basically what we have now in both races is somebody who was for the Guardian and somebody who is against the Guardian program. And <clears throat> that's where the, a lot of these races, I think in terms of how they're communicating with voters, their distinguishing line will be. And we have roughly a minute to go, but uh, if the election were happening today, <clears throat> What would be your your winning ticket? Who do I think would win? And today? you're a Republican, but I want you to look <clears throat> um, ana analytically. I do think I think that vo that voters will split the top of the ticket. I do think that Gillum just has a little bit more momentum and enthusiasm on the ground. I think the same hidden um, on the ground enthusiasm that launched him through the primary will probably carry him into the gubernatorial office. But I see Governor Scott overcoming Senator Nelson in the Senate race. I really do think that he, he will overpower. He is a ferocious campaigner um, and people know and like him after his last eight years and I think he will be able to overcome Nelson. Catherine mm -hmm. Roloff, thank <clears throat> you so much. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. You can find all I Am Brevard episodes on Florida Today's YouTube page. I'll see you again next week.